You're listening to The Foundation of Wellness, a refreshing take on diet and lifestyle with Jessica Dogert, a registered dietitian nutritionist, and Marisa Moon, a primal health coach. Hey you guys, my name is Jessica and I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist and you can learn all about me on my website at jessicadogert.com. What's going on everybody? It's Marisa Moon. I'm a certified primal health coach and intermittent fasting instructor. You can learn more about me at marisamoon.com. So this is episode number 40, you guys, and we have a pretty notable guest, Dr. Stephen Hussey, the heart coach from resourceyourhealth.com, and he's the author of the revolutionary new holistic health book called The Health Evolution, Why Understanding Evolution is the Key to Vibrant Health. So after discovering his passion for health in college, Stephen obtained his doctorate in chiropractic medicine and master's in human nutrition and functional medicine from the University of Western States. And over the years, he has learned the power of food to heal the body, and it all began when he used the proper human diet as part of the healing process to just rid himself of many chronic health ailments. And today he practices chiropractic and functional medicine in Virginia, and he coaches people who have a variety of health concerns, especially heart trouble. And due to his firsthand experience, he also specializes in helping people with type 1 diabetes. I just started reading Stephen's book, you guys, and it really sings to my soul. Evolutionary science has a lot to do with my beliefs in nutrition and well-being, and no matter what your current beliefs are, listeners, you might feel the same way at the end of this episode. Welcome to the show, Dr. Stephen. Welcome. Hey guys, thanks for having me. It's ha- happy to be here. I'm excited to get started. Sweet. I mean, from your book, The Health Evolution, you say that readers will learn why most chronic disease is not genetic, the truth behind why our society is suffering from disease, how our epidemic of disease directly relates to the health of the planet, strategies to right the ship, achieve better health, and save our species. That sounds like a pretty big undertaking, I've got to say. Tell us <laughs> what led you to write such a monstrous, impactful topic. Uh, well, I mean, it really boils down to life experience. So uh, when I was a child, very young age, I think uh, my parents noticed at age two, I was having trouble, like um, I was wheezing and coughing and doing things like that. Uh, I had lots of uh, allergies, um, diagnosed with asthma, I used to break out in chronic hives, like huge uh, hives all over my body. Um, I ended up with the autoimmune disease, type 1 diabetes. And so because of that, my parents and I uh, relied on uh, Western medicine uh, to help me through those things. Uh, and they were very good at, at managing the symptoms that came along with those. Um, but I never got explanations for why. Uh, and things kind of continued to get worse. And so as I grew up, uh, especially when I went to college and was doing things on my own, uh, I started to realize that I guess the way I lived my life and the food I ate and the stress I experienced had an impact on these things. And so that led me down to a, you know, a path of professional medical degree, uh, functional medicine, master's degree, uh, really looking for the answers to why my body reacted the way that it did and why my friends' bodies didn't. Uh, and so, uh, I think that functional medicine, um, and, and just a medical um, degree in general gave me a lot of answers. Uh, but it was still, it was still very focused on diagnosis. Uh, it was, you know, all these symptoms and exam findings and blood work findings, you know, that led us to the diagnosis. So it was very focused on that. And without the diagnosis, we didn't know what to do. And the emotional medicine was a little bit better. Uh, it wasn't so focused on the diagnosis. It was more focused on imbalances and why this is happening. But I became very interested in why those imbalances were there. Uh, and it led me, didn't quite lead me. I did a lot of searching, but I eventually, um, really honed in on evolution uh, and it gave me the answers that I wanted and I wanted to share those answers with the world. And so I wrote this book down uh, to uh, get those answers out there. I'm glad you wrote this book. That's very cool. <laughs> you know what? You mentioned that you um, were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at such a young age. And I'm sure for Western medicine, it's, you know, you're insulin dependent, right? But um, what's mm-hmm. your approach like in terms of functional medicine day in and day out? Yeah. So, uh, I found that I found it very curious that uh, when I found out that diet was such had such a huge impact on me being able to manage those uh, those blood sugars, 
Um, I was, it was very curious that I'd never heard that from any doctor um, mm -hmm. ever. No one had ever told me that um, what I ate made a difference. All they said was, you can eat whatever you want, just give yourself more insulin. Right. Um, and now we know that even with, uh, even with normal people who don't have type 1 diabetes, like, we want insulin levels to be stable. And so the more I can do to my diet so that I didn't have to give myself as much insulin or make it more stable, the better it would be. Um, and so now I remember, you know, bolusing, which is giving myself insulin, um, you know, up to 10 or 12 units per meal. And now I don't even bolus any, you know, wow. per meal because what I'm eating is just so low carbohydrate. Uh, and sometimes I will have carbs, but um, most of my meals are, are so low carbohydrate, I don't have to. My basal rate, which is just the rate that my pump gives me all day long, is enough. Uh, and so I went from, you know, upwards of 100 units a day, maybe not quite that much, maybe like 80, um, to like now I use an average of like 20, 24 units um, a day. So very easy to control. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm happy for you. Real quick before we move on, you guys, I wanted to have you, um, Dr. Hussey, explain briefly what type 1 diabetes is and also what functional medicine is. Yeah, so um, so diabetes is two types. So there's type 1 and type 2. Type 1 used to be called like juvenile onset because we saw it more happening in kids. Um, but now even um, some adults are getting diagnosed with type 1. Like my brother was 22 when he was diagnosed. He's also type 1 diabetic. Oh, wow. Um, and we knew exactly what was going on when it was happening because of my experiences. Uh, and then there's type 2, um, which is more, um, I guess, kind of metabolic syndrome. So it's, it's more like insulin resistance. Your body is, is making insulin, um, but your body is not responding to it. Whereas in type 1, I'm not making insulin at all anymore. And so type 1 is considered an autoimmune disease, which means my body attacked part of itself, uh, the specific part being the islet cells or the islets of Langerhans cells in my pancreas that make uh, insulin. Um, and so they don't work anymore. Although I have seen some things that, that show that potentially they may not be dead. They just may be um, prevented from doing their job. So I, mm. I still have hope that I can turn them back on one day, but I don't know. Wow. Um, whereas in type 2, um, it's almost like the, the receptors to insulin for people's, on people's cells has gotten so overworked that they went on strike. That's kind of how I explain it. And so you can secrete all the insulin you want. Uh, you're not going to respond to it. And then eventually, your body gets so tired of secreting that insulin that it stops secreting insulin. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's mainly due to um, the, the types of diets that we're eating in Westernized society uh, that's driving up blood sugars and causing your body to have to do all this work that eventually gets tired. So that's the difference, type 1 and type 2. And then functional medicine is, I think of it as like a reaction to Western medicine. Because um, Western medicine is not working as well as we would like it to. Uh, and it, people in Western medicine may not be so uh, ready to admit that it's not working as well as it would be, but it's not. And so um, I think others and other practitioners have gotten frustrated with the results they're getting. And I think West, or functional medicine has, has kind of been, has come from that. Okay, So it's really looking at why is this happening. I'm not just looking at what it is as far as like getting a diagnosis, you know, analyzing symptoms and, and uh, exam findings and things like that and figuring out what it is, but figuring out why it's there. If we figure out why it's there, maybe we can change the person's environment to, um, to alter their health outcome. And then I, I like to say that I took it a step further and said, why do those imbalances happen in the first place, which is why the book came along. Thank you. Very cool. I have one more question, if you don't mind, in terms of type 1 diabetes. So you said that your brother was diagnosed when he was 22, and you said mm -hmm. your family knew right away that, you know, that's what it was. What was he experiencing, or how did you know exactly that it was type 1 diabetes? Yeah, so I think, I can't remember if he called me or if my mom called me and told me that he had called her, but it was basically... He was, um, you know, drinking gallons of water at a time, mm. up all night peeing, uh, very, very thirsty, very dry mouth. And um, it had been a couple of weeks of that. And we said, well, go to the hospital. And then me and my dad drove down that night um, to the hospital to be with him. So it was it was pretty clear uh, what it was to me. Um, although for him, he could just, could just thought, oh, I'm dehydrated. But uh, we knew what it was. And then... Um, I believe then when he got to the hospital, there was ketones in his urine because his body was being forced to burn fat, which ketones are not a bad thing. They're obviously a very good thing, but ketoacidosis, when your body has no choice but to burn ketones, that's a bad thing. 
Uh, and so he had, he had ketones in his urine when he got to the hospital. His blood sugar was pretty high, so it was pretty obvious then. Very interesting. So yeah. in your book, you explain that misinformation about health has created a healthcare system based on false information and has left the general public lacking the knowledge and tools necessary to lead a life that creates optimal health. So can you better explain to our listeners how the American healthcare system could possibly be based on so much false information? So in a nutshell, if you could, because this could be a really new reality check for so many people right here in this moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try and keep it simple, but it goes back a long way. So if we're looking at the, uh, I guess, uh, the start of Western medicine, it was kind of started when um, John Rockefeller, he had, I mean, he was a good businessman. He had all this oil at his disposal and he was looking for ways to use it. And he found that um, it could be used to extract ingredients from certain plants to concentrate them. Uh, and so that was kind of the birth of these medications, this huge pharmaceutical industry that we have today. And so the, what he did, though, um, and I don't think he thought he was doing anything bad. I think he was just being a businessman. He approached all the medical schools or a lot of the medical schools and um, said that he would help fund them if they taught his curriculum of using these pharmaceuticals that he was making. And so uh, things just kind of built on that. And now we have this very pharmaceutical based medical system. Uh, and I think that it's not that anybody was evil or diabolically designing this whole thing. It's just that we're in a capitalist society and, you know, you look at, you look for ways to use your money to make more money. Um, every company is watching their bottom dollar, but that, that puts a huge conflict of interest, uh, in, in our Western medical system, because what we see is we have practitioners, we have insurance companies and we have pharmaceutical companies and the pharmaceutical companies are, um, funding the education of the practitioners, medical doctors. And so obviously they're not going to um, fund a curriculum that would encourage them to cure the diseases that they're without medication, that their medications would, would use. And that's, again, not evil or diabolical. It's just that they're watching out for the bottom line. They're trying to, to sell products. Uh, and then we have the practitioners who are diagnosing uh, the patients based on what they're going to get paid for. And so if they don't have a diagnosis, uh, to give to the insurance company, the insurance company is not going to pay them. Mm. Uh, and so the insurance companies are only going to, um, uh, they're only going to pay for the, the treatments that have been, you know, so-called um, researched and clinically backed uh, through research. And so when the pharmaceutical companies are funding most of the research, then they're only going to, the research is showing that the drugs are the best thing. And so we get this kind of trifecta that's happening. And again, it's, it's just a bunch of people doing their jobs, living in a capitalist society. But what's, what's happening is that the money is flowing through that trifecta and the patients are not getting better. Uh, so we have to assess that. And I think as a society, um, look at that system and be like, okay, it's not working. And then be brave enough to say, okay, what else can we do? And you know, throw the bottom dollar or the bottom line out the window and say, we got to get people better first. And so the other interesting thing is that I mentioned that um, – pharmaceutical companies are funding most of the research. And so they're throwing a lot of money into this research because it's very expensive to do clinical trials. And they're not going to fund um, trials that they don't think are going to be favorable to their product. And so we get a lot of, I mean, we've learned a lot about biochemistry from pharmaceutical research, which is awesome. But um, they're only really going to fund the trials that they think are going to turn out good for their product. And there's actually a lot of um, interesting um, research uh, through a guy named Ben Goldiker and he's showing that the large percentage of the clinical trials that don't end up the way they want them to, they don't publish them. So if I go into PubMed and want to figure out what's most best way to treat some condition, but not all the research that was done on that condition or that drug was published, then I'm not getting an accurate representation of, of how it works. Um, I'm almost getting a more positive um, uh, outcome or the research is more positive for that drug when it really shouldn't be. Maybe it's maybe 50-50 or something. Um, so lots of conflicts of interest there. But I think that was a nutshell. I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you. It, it makes me wonder if this might be a good place for you to explain to our listeners, how could it be possible that their doctor, who they trust and who cares for them, um, maybe their primary care doctor or even someone like their cardiologist who specializes in their heart health, 
how could their doctor not have the answers? How does that system and, and you know, all of the, basically from where it began, how does all of that lead to a, a physician not knowing the answers? Yeah. Um, I think that medical school is very good at, at teaching, you know, medical students about, you know, the body itself, you know, anatomy, physiology, the things that we know. Um, but when it comes to, again, the why, it's not really good at teaching them that. I mean, first of all, um, there's almost no nutrition classes in medical school, in most medical schools. I think some of them are starting to have some now, but again, that's a reaction to what people are wanting, um, what society is wanting. Um, and so they're not, it's just the training. I mean, doctors are smart people, obviously. They, they go through that rigorous program, but they're trained in a way that's very limiting. Uh, and we've, we've kind of put this, this stigma around doctors that they do know everything uh, that, or they should know everything. And so, but I, I think that what we're seeing, and I think the reason that functional medicine has become popular is because not only are doctors frustrated with not getting results, but patients are getting frustrated too. And so they're looking somewhere else because they go to, um, you know, they get second, third, fourth opinions and get four or five different answers. Mm -hmm. And so it's very clear that, that what, doctors are learning in medical school is not the only way for it to be done. Um, and so I think that people are starting to educate themselves, um, which is very, very important because that's kind of what a capitalist society um, uh, predisposes us to. We, we work really good or really hard at our job. This one thing that we do, um, but we outsource everything else, including our health. And it's been outsourced to uh, the medical profession. And when the results aren't, um, happening, you know, or, or when it's, it's actually when it's, when it's killing people the way that it is, because I think it's over almost 600,000 deaths per year associated with our Western medical system. Um, so that makes it, I believe, the leading cause of death in the country, um, besides, uh, behind or in front of heart disease and cancer. So, um, we really have to, to step back and ask ourselves if what we're doing, if we, if the way we're practicing medicine should be practiced this way, uh, and and look at the results because people all the time say to me all the time, they say, well, if, if, if that was the case, then all the doctors should know about it. And it's not the case. Um, and I think a, a good example in a different field is, is like Bill Gates, you know, he, he dropped out of college and he does not have any type of, I don't know if he ever went back, but um, when he started this company and became this expert, he didn't have any college degree. And so, but I, I, you know, I would go to him today and ask him business advice or computer advice. You know, he'd be like one of the number one guys if I had access to him to do that. And so just because someone has a degree in something doesn't mean they know everything. And just because someone doesn't have a degree doesn't mean they know nothing. And I think that we need to start uh, looking for different places in our, in our world for our health answers. That's why I named my website Resource Your Health, Find New Sources of Health. Hmm. That's good to know. Well, one thing I'd like to address before we get into some of your just philosophical and practical theories from the book mm -hmm. is the actual topic of evolution. You probably knew what you were going up against just by using the word evolution in your title and in your subtitle. And I was happy to see that addressed early on in your book. And you stated that there's a lot of evolution talk in this book. Since I realize that not everyone agrees with this particular theory, I have a favor to ask. If you do not accept the theory of evolution, please do not dismiss the overall message of the book. You do not have to change your beliefs to benefit from the information or parts of the book that can help people achieve health and create a better world. Yeah. Um, so just as I said there, like to get a result or get a health, a better health outcome from what I recommend in the book, you do not have to believe in evolution. Um, but I think evolution and religion go, go nicely together. But I think it goes back to um, what I was talking about with Bill Gates. You know, just because someone doesn't have something that would say they know something about this subject, um, just because evolution says something different than what you believe, or vice versa, if religion says something different than what evolution is saying, uh, it doesn't mean we can't benefit from the information it has to offer. Uh, we don't like, like I said, we don't have to change the beliefs, but I really just think it means be open-minded. Uh, I think that 
you're never going to find answers if you, you know, rabbit hole yourself and looking at the same information over and over and over again, or only, I mean, I think that like Instagram is the perfect example of this. You can follow all the people that uh, say what you, what you think or agree with you and your thinking, and then you're just going to go down this rabbit hole and be um, uh, almost dogmatic in the, in the way you think. Whereas, or you could like all these people that have different opinions than you and take from them what, uh, you can, uh, what you can learn from them, not knowing, knowing that you're not going to start believing what they believe, but at least you're getting a different perspective. You're seeing more, um, uh, diversity, uh, and that's gonna, that's really good for your brain, but it's also, uh, I think it keeps people open-minded. Well, I know why the topic of evolution is so important in relation to our health, but I know this is like a totally new concept, Um, words like ancestral health, fields of study like evolutionary science are completely new to a lot of people today. And when when you first hear about it, if you are strong um, in the field of Christianity and your beliefs and spirituality, you might feel conflicted. But I was pleased to see that there's a big world out there on the internet combining Christianity and evolutionary beliefs. It's often referred to as evolutionary creationism. And anyone listening that's um, interested in that, that theology would be interested in seeing biologos.org. That's B-I-O-L-O-G-O-S dot org. It's their mission to share the belief that science and Christianity can support each other. So just wanted to let everybody know. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I, I think that in a way, religion came from evolution. Because if you look at what humans were doing um, before we... Um, or I guess as we came together in societies and formed civilizations, like the traits that were selected for, the ones that survived to to further generations, were ones that were were the people that were more likely to come together and form a community. Um, And so lots of times uh, they had common beliefs in that community. And I think that was kind of the birth of religion, um, as well as people looking for answers for why the world was the way it was. Um, But if you look at it in that sense, Um, it means that we evolve to come together in communities and have common beliefs. And so I think that since evolution is such a slow process, um, that it's very important for us to recognize that um, that's how we evolved and that since that's the way it is and that I'm not going to change as an individual, maybe generations down the line, uh, humans would change, but I'm not going to. And it's very important for, for me to nourish that aspect of my uh, physiology, my health, that need for community, for a belief in something greater than yourself, um, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be a religious God, it could be nature, it could be whatever. Um, but it's very important for health to nourish that aspect of things, because that's how we evolve. Uh, and so I, I'm definitely not against religion at all. I think it does a lot of great things for people. And I think it's necessary, or else we wouldn't do it. Well, basically, exactly like what you were saying, I mean, I don't know if I interpreted this right, but like there's so much more to health than like the food that we're eating and like the fitness activities that we're doing. It's about community and like having like a higher power than us, like whether that be religion or, you know, whatever that may be. I think it's really important to focus basically on the functional medicine or like that holistic approach too. Yeah, we got to look at everything. Hey, it's Marisa Moon, and I've got a special announcement for you. No matter where you live in the world, you could take advantage of this. When you're transforming your health and you're on a mission, you might be wondering what kind of habits do you need to put into place and how do you take small actionable steps that massively uplevel your nutrition and your fitness and your self-care and your mindset? Well, Habits to Thrive is a new online summit that will last five days plus two encore days, and it's hosted by Deanna Wilcox and Anya Perry, plus 17 more primal health coaches just like me who are passionate about helping you take your health to the next level. I'm doing a talk on how carb moderation can help free you from endless dieting, and I can't wait for you to check it out. This summit is for you if you're determined to create permanent habits across all areas of your health without the overwhelm and the chronic setbacks. In addition to the daily videos, participants will receive numerous free resources and entries to some incredible giveaways. Did I mention the whole thing is free? 
and it's all online. So join us on May 6th through May 12th, 2019 by registering at bit.ly slash habits to thrive. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash habits to thrive. Talk soon. So you have four principles of evolution that, you know, when you understood them, gave you so much more clarity as to why you suffered from chronic disease as a child. Can you tell us what those four principles are? Yeah, this is my favorite thing to talk about. Um, So these four things, so these are just things, like you said, that uh, when I came across them or when I learned more about them, um, it gave me answers. So the first one is uh, the idea of natural selection, which is something that Darwin, you know, people who quote Darwin say all the time, natural selection. Um, and I had a hard time wrapping my head around the fact that a, an individual could literally change his characteristics to become different and more adapted to its environment. But that's because an individual can't do that. This happens over generations. Like, um, let, can you just so start from the that, very beginning? Like, what is natural selection? What, what are you talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm, okay. I'll get there. Um, so natural selection. So there's, if we're looking at uh, any type of species living in its natural environment, there are lots of different things in that environment that, um, that Darwin would call selection pressures. So things that would influence what would happen in the next generation. Okay, and it, it does that. Uh, by, I mean, let's give the example of like a peacock. Okay, so peacocks have these giant tail feathers um, and they're trying to impress uh, the females. Sorry, okay? I'm laughing. And I remember. <laughs> I'm laughing because I used to <laughs> raise peacocks. I remember so thinking weird. that like, <laughs> when I was a kid, like, oh, the, the pretty ones with the pretty tails, that's got to be the females. And when I learned that it was the males, I was like, what? Yeah. You know, like, why are they so pretty? And then the females are just like, they don't have these big tail feathers, you know? Um, but it was because it, to, the, to, to the females, it would, it would represent two things. One, maybe more than that, but one of them uh, is that they um, were good at finding food, enough food that they could develop this oh. huge uh, tail feathers, this, this presentation. So um, that was one thing. The second thing was that they could also get away from predators despite having this, this huge tail feather thing tied on the back of them. Uh, so they were, you know, demonstrating fitness for the environment as well. And so, um, so they're more likely to get a mating partner when they're doing this. Okay. And so over time, the only um, peacocks that would be able to pass on their genes are the ones with the, the biggest tail feathers and the prettiest tail feathers. And so the other ones who didn't have pretty tail feathers would not get to pass on their genes. And so those ugly tail feathers or those small tail feather genes would not get passed on. So over generations, we end up with this bird with this huge tail feather display, um, and that's the characteristic of the peacock. Um, same with like um, the long tongue of an anteater. You know, the, the longer the tongue, the easier it can get at food that is deep in a log or something. And so the longer the, the ones who had the longer tongues uh, were able to nourish themselves better and then pass on their genes because they survived, um, whereas the other ones couldn't do that because either their, their tongues were um, too short, maybe they survived a little bit, but uh, no, no uh, mating partner selected them or, or whatever because they were malnourished. And so just over time, and this is a very slow process, then that's how natural selection works. And so there's so many different selection pressures. It's not just one or two things, um, but that's just a basic example of what natural selection is. And so when I learned that, I was like, oh, that makes more sense. It's not like I could put myself in a new environment and eventually adapt to it, which is key. So that's the first one, natural selection. The second one is that um, as far as when people talk about evolution, they talk about us evolving from apes, but that's actually not what happened. So humans and apes evolved from a common ancestor. So a, a living thing that does not exist today anymore. Uh, it was... Uh, Maybe you could call it a hybrid between us, but it was just something we don't even know what it looked like really. Um, we, we probably have some uh, archaeological evidence of what it looked like skeletally, but we don't really know what it looked like on the outside. And then when, when, when a species, let's say we had a species in the, in the same place, if they get divided or half of that uh, group goes somewhere else, there's new selection pressures wherever they went. Okay, And so 
that can create two different species over time, which is why we have um, the, I think the African and the Samaritan orangutan. They look pretty much the same, but they're really different species and they can't mate together um, because they were, they were in different environments. Uh, they became secluded in different environments. And so that's what happened with this, with this, um, uh, this ape or human ape or whatever it was way back in the day. Um, and it, it got split. And so the one line eventually became orangutans and gorillas and chimps and bonobos and all those different um, uh, species of apes. And then we became modern humans. Now, there was a lot of different species of uh, pre-humans and then modern humans um, and pre-modern humans that came before us. And they branched off and died uh, and died off. And then modern humans were the ones that, you know, survived and came are, are here today. Um, but it's, it's just important to note that it wasn't like this direct lineage that happened, you know, like from apes and then to human. It was, there was all these branching off and dying of different species. And we see that in archaeological evidence. Um, but it happened because of natural selection in different um, um, environments. So I think it's also very interesting to note that it wasn't linear because there's also evidence that um, lots of these species were existing at the same time. So there was many different species, species of human at the same time in the mm-hmm. same place. Um, and the most notable one is um, modern humans and Neanderthals. Um, the modern humans evolved in Africa, but the Neanderthals had already migrated out of Africa and were in Northern Europe. And so modern humans came out of Africa at some point and encountered the Neanderthals and we think even bred with them because we, yeah. all of us, have a percentage of Neanderthal DNA. So they, they were probably, you know, different species, but able to breed, um, which I don't know if that classifies them maybe as almost the same species. But eventually we outcompeted them. We're not sure how, but they died off and we did not. I'm like so 2% Neanderthal, Neanderthal, according to 23andMe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm like three. So, right. Cool. Wait, by the way, um, can you... I don't know if that's better for health or can not. Can you no. um, explain, like, briefly um, what kind of timeline you're talking about? How many millions... Like, at what pace do things evolve, and how could a species evolve to be a new species? How long is that? That's point number three, so perfect. Um, oh! Yeah, nice. Um, so we're talking about the split from apes. We're talking about around six million years ago. Okay. Wow. Um, yeah, so to put that in context, like, ancient Egypt was, like, five or 6,000 years ago. So very, very long time ago um, when we split from um, When were dinosaurs? 65 million years ago. Oh, my gosh. gosh. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, at least that's when they died. They were around before that. Um, Whoa. Yeah. So huge amounts of times here. So and then we look at when modern humans evolved. We see the first modern humans. And it's somewhere between... 200 to 300,000 years ago. They just found, I think, last year, evidence of modern humans being around 300,000 years ago, somewhere in Morocco or something. And um, so quite a long time okay, that modern humans have been here. Again, ancient Egypt, which you think of as super long ago, was only five or 6,000 years ago. And so if we look at uh, how fast evolution, I think the, the best evidence we have for this is this. There was a Russian scientist named Dmitry Belyev, and he started selectively breeding Arctic foxes up in Siberia um, for docile traits. So if they were more likely to come up to him or eat food out of his hand, he would take those. And then he would breed them with another or a male or a female um, that was also more likely to do that. So he was selecting for this, this docile uh, behavior. And he did that generation after generation. And about 30 generations, because the reproductive cycle of foxes Pretty, it's way smaller than ours. I think it's maybe two months or something. Um, so we did this, and about 30 generations, he started seeing changes. Um, he started um, seeing that, A, the behavior changed, but also he saw that they were losing like their wild characteristics. So their ears started to flop. They didn't have to be up, ready, listening to their environment for predators. Wow. Uh, they were living in pretty much in domestication. Uh, and they were, they were uh, it was almost like they were favoring humans and what humans desire because we like it when the ears flop and people think that's cute and things like that. Uh, but also they were losing like their, uh, or their, their, um, their fur coats color started to change because they didn't need to be camouflaged as much anymore. And so, so that shows us that it takes at least 30 generations 
but that was, was very, very controlled um, natural selection. And that usually doesn't happen that way in nature. Also, it was with a species that um, reproduces pretty quickly. So it can adapt a little bit quicker. Or if we have a, a long reproductive cycle like ours, like nine months, um, or an elephant, like 22 months, then it's very hard for that species to adapt very quickly because you need generations to do that, which is why bacteria are so resilient because they can reproduce like every 30 minutes. And so mm. they can split. They don't really reproduce. Their, some of them do, but um, they can you know, divide every 30 minutes. So if their environment changes, give them 30 minutes and they'll start to evolve. Uh, whereas us, it takes a very long time. And so that, that leads me directly into point number four, which is if the environment of a species changes too rapidly, there's no way that it, its physiology could evolve to, to um, cater to that environment. So we brought up the dinosaurs earlier. So they, they went extinct pretty quickly. And that's because something happened. I mean, there's debate about what it was, whether a meteor hit the earth or the earth decided to erupt all its volcanoes at one time, the environment changed so quickly that there's no way they could have survived because um, the reproductive cycle was not long enough to give them time to adapt to that new environment. Okay? And so if we apply that to humans and we apply that to our chronic disease epidemic, we could, I would say that our environment's changing um, quickly not quickly enough to kill us like it did to the dinosaurs, but quickly enough to cause us um, ailments. Our bodies are clearly struggling in this environment that we live in. Um, some of us are more adapted to it, than, or more, um, our genes are more hardy to it than others, um, and that's why we see this difference in, in health. Um, we all know the person that drinks and smokes till they're 100 and they're fine. We also know the people who are the kids who have cancer. So it's just, there's a huge variation, but the point is, is that our environments, our way of life, is changing so rapidly, um, rapidly enough to cause us symptoms. Um, so we need to think about how can we go back uh, within the confines of modern day society. When you say environment, can you tell our audience what you mean by that? Yeah, so most people when I say environment would think, you know, nature or the, the natural parks, things like that. But I'm talking about your personal environment, what your body comes into contact with every day, the toxins the food you eat, the stress you experience, the relationships you have, that environment. Um, if that changes, the things that your body is exposed to every single day changes too rapidly, it can't adapt to those things. Give us a few examples of what has changed so rapidly today. Yeah, so there's, there's five imbalances that I think of in the body um, that are clear indicators that our environment is changing too rapidly. Okay, so... One of the first one is food. Uh, I mean, that's uh, most people know that if you eat better, you're going to experience better health. It's just all this confusion and all this information about what's the best way to eat. Um, so if we look at uh, around 10,000 years ago, which is kind of the dawn of civilizations when it first started showing up and humans started coming together in communities and started farming. Um, I think that's the biggest change our diet saw um, from modern humans 300,000 years ago and definitely from six million years ago. So for the vast majority of time, we were eating way dick. We didn't farm at all. Um, there was not this high consumption of um, crops. So what happened then was farming allowed us to stay in one place. And I think it was actually um, almost a reaction to humans at that time because there's also this huge decrease in megafauna. Um, so we're talking about large mammals uh, that, that they started to go away, most likely because we overhunted and killed them. Um, but they dropped off, and so then we didn't have these huge troves of nutrients anymore. So I think the reaction was, was farming. Uh, and it wasn't like one human did this. It was just like over generations, this is kind of what happened. We started depending more on plants. And so that was a huge change to our diet. And so it, I think that it was... It was a big change, but it was, it was obviously humans could still survive. You can, we can live on plants uh, or, or, you know, grains and, and we didn't have soy back then probably, but, uh, but grains and sugars and things like that, corn, that kind of stuff. But there's evidence of the first farmers struggling with bone structure and being able to form proper bones. And there's evidence of uh, ancient Egyptians who were a largely farming culture. They rarely ate animals. 
um, that ha- they have atherosclerosis. It's, it's, it's one aspect of heart disease. So it's the hardening of your arteries. Um, I, th- I think it's, it's telling that we see these, these things happening uh, in, and we see um, these ancient civilizations that struggle with their health uh, when they um, converted over to farming um, or started farming. So that's the first one, is food. Uh, we've massively changed the way we eat, and it's even gotten worse. It's now we overly process those, those uh, crops um, to where there's almost nothing left besides empty calories. Uh, and so that's, that's problematic, A, for the fact that we don't have nutrients, micronutrients in them, but also we just we talked about diabetes. Like that's the number one thing that's going to spike blood sugar and lead to an insulin resistance situation. So um, the second one is toxins. So if we look at, and this is, this is something that's been um, way more recent. Uh, I, I'd say the, the biggest uh, change that happened was the Industrial Revolution. So all of a sudden we started using, uh, we started mining things out of the earth, like heavy metals and coal uh, and oil. And those are things that were deposited in the earth. And therefore we never came in contact with them as we were evolving for those 300,000 years as modern humans. And so within, you know, two to 300 years now, we have all these toxic chemicals that we mined out of the earth are now in the environment and exposed, expo- we're exposed to them. And then not to mention the fact that um, we've also got technology that's also creating all these synthetic toxins in a lab, things that have never naturally become combined before, um, like plastic is one of them, um, that is also has no place in our physiology. And so our body either gets rid of it, stores it somewhere, um, and, um, or um, it affects the body in a negative way. Um, it starts breaking down physiological mechanisms because it can interfere with them. Uh, it can tear apart mitochondria. It can do all kinds of stuff, all these toxins. And so I think it's something like uh, 70,000 new toxic chemicals since 1950. Um, and that's the direct result of you know, synthetically combining molecules and, and elements that uh, weren't that way in the natural world. So that's number two, toxins. Um, number three, I would say, um, is, is gut health. Um, so we're looking at all the different things that um, influence our gut health. And I think it starts from day one. Uh, back in the day when we were evolving, everybody would have been a natural birth. Uh, everyone would have been exposed to the bacteria of the birth canal, which would inoculate their, their gut. And also that bacteria that, um, that mom gave baby uh, was very specific to, for the baby to digest her breast milk. And so we're seeing a lot of things go awry there. Um, a kids are not being breastfed almost at all. I think it's a third of of births are cesarean section, um, and so we're really messing with that process that starts our that you know gives us that good base for gut health. Uh, and then not to mention the fact that um, there's so many different toxins which we already talked about, uh, especially glyphosate, which is a a herbicide made by the company Monsanto, which is now Bayer. Um, it's very disruptive. To your to your gut, and it, it was I think originally patented as an antibiotic, so it destroys your good gut microbes. Um, so there's gut, and then there's um, let's see mitochondria. So mitochondria are the little structures in our cells, little organelles that make our energy. They make ATP, which is kind of like our our inner body's energy currency. And uh, when they get damaged, and they can't. Um, they can't make energy efficiently, we, our health suffers. I mean, if you don't have energy to do cellular processes, you're not going to get very far. Uh, and so the things that damage mitochondria, like, like we've already talked about, are poor diet, we're eating high-carbohydrate foods, and then also toxins. Toxins can be directly damaging to mitochondria. Um, so these things are starting to intertwine, uh, these five imbalances. Um, but mitochondrial damage has been associated with, I think, pretty much every chronic disease. Um, so if any, any disease that someone has, there's an aspect of mitochondrial damage. The mitochondria are not using oxygen and using food to make energy as well as they should be. And then uh, the last one is our autonomic nervous system, which is the ner- part of our nervous system that interprets or tells our body whether we're in a safe environment or a threatening one. And so we have this um, balance that needs to happen in our nervous system. We don't want to get, we don't want to think we're always threatened. We don't want to, you know, veg out all the time either and not do anything. So we need this balance, and they're, they're designed to work that way. And unfortunately, 
we live in a society uh, that places a lot of emphasis on on um, stressful situations. I think that you know our brains evolved in a natural world, uh, and it did not, it never confronted um, the stresses that we have today. They, the stresses we have today aren't, most of the time, aren't life threatening, but the way our brains work, we make them, we make our bodies have a life threatening response to them. Okay, so it's almost as if if we we're living in the wild, we would have only had a stressful response when something was trying to kill us, um, like trying to hunt us. And that was pretty much it. And then after that, it would kind of shut down. Um, but now, all day long, we think about, am I going to have enough money? Uh, are my kids okay? Is, are my parents okay? Am I going to get to work? Am I going to get that job? Um, all this kind of stuff. And um, we're the only species that can think our way into this stress response. Um, all the other species don't have a stress response unless it's necessary. And then after that stress is gone, it goes away. Whereas if we had a stressful event, like we got in a car accident, we'd probably think about it for months afterwards and be scared to drive or even scared of certain vehicles on the highway because we're thinking our way into that stress response. And so it creates this imbalance in our autonomic nervous system. And that has also been associated with countless diseases. Um, there's an aspect of this imbalance uh, in any much, pretty much all chronic diseases. So uh, pretty interesting uh, stuff there. But that's the five imbalances that I look at with people. Are those considered evolutionary mismatches? I know you talk about that a lot in your book. And um, I think now, I think about it all the time. Everywhere I look, everywhere I turn, when I think about dysfunction or why people I love are getting sick with no answers, I think about evolutionary mismatches. So um, just kind of summarize that would be great. Yeah, so... uh... Yeah, those are direct. Uh, those are the things that I think are the most mismatched um, between, like, so the the way that we're living our life and the things we're exposed to today, like the stress we have, the toxins, the food, everything um, is is mismatched between the way our physiology evolved. And so, if we're not giving our physiology the correct environment, we can't expect it to give us health. It's having to deal with all these other things that, mm. that it's never exposed before. And I think uh, one good example. Is, is joints. They evolved not to have a direct blood supply. Uh, and our joints get nourished through motion, which means we're evolved to move. And if we look at what's happening as far as our jobs these days, we're sitting a lot. Um, we're not as active. We get in cars, we drive for hours, um, all these different things. And our joints aren't getting nourished. Um, so when we look at why people have back pain, why people have knee pain, why degeneration is uh, so prevalent, it's because people aren't moving their bodies the way that they evolved to. Um, if we've been doing that for millions of years, then maybe um, those joints would have evolved a direct blood supply. Um, they wouldn't have needed us to move to get nutrition to them. Um, so it's interesting from a chiropractic perspective, uh, thinking mm-hmm. about joints all day long, that's what I, that's what I attribute our, our pain to. Um, I actually have two questions. Like, with when you're dealing with your clients, um, I know you talked about food toxins, gut health, but really intriguing to me, the mitochondria and then the automatic like nervous system. Like, what's your action plan to increase mitochondria, or what is your action plan? I think a lot of like the automatic nervous system is thoughts too, right? Yeah. It's like not living in that scarcity mindset or fear and not being so stressed out about simple things like, am I going to have enough money to pay my bills and things like that? Mm-hmm. So, how do you go about all of that with clients? Uh, well, really interesting. Um, just this morning I shared on Instagram a study that um, showed that stress, um, increased stress, when people reported that increased stress, that it had a negative effect on their health, like their mortality, but only if they perceived that stress as detrimental to their health. So you could have all the stress in the world. If you didn't think it was detrimental to your health, it had no correlation to increase mortality. (laughs) Um, So it just goes to show that our thoughts... The way we perceive our stress is possibly more important than having the stress in general. Okay, um, but as far as like how to approach uh, someone with a very imbalanced autonomic nervous system, uh, it's it's doing things that um, trigger your body that you're in a safe environment. That's what this that's what the nervous system is all about. Um, is are you in a safe environment or a threatening one? And so if we look at some of the things that. Um, that trigger that, uh, nature is one of them. So the, the irony is, is that lots of people, if you put them in nature, may be more stressed initially uh, than they would be um, 
uh, naturally, you know, but there's studies that show that people in cities who spend more time in green spaces, so parks, had reduced cortisol levels, uh, significantly reduced, and not just for the day, but for weeks afterwards. Uh, there's studies that show um, community uh, is incredibly stimulating to the parasympathetic nervous system, the, the rest and digest um, uh, aspect of the, the nervous system. Uh, and so finding your tribe is very important. Finding people that um, connect with you uh, and that you can connect with and having that community, that support is very good. And then also, again, I think it's important to not just stick to your tribe, but also get out and, and uh, come across new ideas. But as far as having that good support, community is huge. There's also studies that show that um, uh, increased uh, there's increased heart attacks in people who didn't have like a best friend or a spouse or a dog. Um, and when, the, when people were isolated like that, uh, they had very high levels of stress and more heart attacks. So uh, there's that. And then there's kind of like weird ways that you can like hack it, like people um, splashing cold water on your face um, or initiating gag reflex, like that'll do it, or, or singing uh, at the top of your lungs. That can stimulate your, your rest and digest state. And it's all because of the anatomy, where the vagus nerve is. And that's the nerve you're trying to stimulate. Um, so like singing and the gag reflex is just because it's close to that nerve. Uh, and cold water on your face is because um, your vagus nerve directly connects your facial muscles to your heart, uh, which is very interesting because our face is how we express our emotions and our heart is where we feel our emotions. Um, so very, very interesting stuff. Uh, we're wired the way we are for a reason. Uh, and then, so there's lots of different ways um, to stimulate parasympathetic. And, if, and the way I interpret it is, it's like, oh, these are all things that would have happened naturally by our way of life if we were living out in nature, like we were supposed to. Um, and then as far as mitochondria, the two things that I think damage mitochondria the most are um, toxins, especially heavy metals. So aluminum, cadmium, mercury, um, arsenic, things like that. And then, um, and then also, so this may get a little bit geeky, but um, if we're, when we eat a diet that's high in carbohydrate, we make more, uh, I call it exhaust. Just like when your car burns energy, you, it makes an exhaust. Well, we make more exhaust when we burn um, high carbohydrate foods or, or purely carbohydrate foods, like the processed sugars and grains and things like that. Um, even too much uh, fructose, so like high fructose corn syrup, bad idea. Um, so we make more exhaust, um, that's bad, and our body has to get rid of that. But if there's too much to get rid of, it ends up damaging tissues. And since it's made right there by the mitochondria, it ends up damaging the mitochondria. So converting to a you know higher fat, more efficient uh, fat burning um, fuel makes less exhaust. And so we get less of that damage and your body can actually pump away more or uh, that exhausts more easily. And so that protects our mitochondria and it can allow it to heal. Cool. So. Awesome. Thank you. Good answer. <laughs> so a huge trend right now is just to make small changes to help save the planet and save diminishing species from existing or extinction in the wild. And I believe that you have a lot of thoughts on how chronic disease relates to the loss in diversity of species on our planet. So wouldn't it be great if we could save ourselves and save the planet at once? Would you like to talk a little bit more about this? Yeah. So I, um, I started out writing a book uh, about health and evolution and things like that. And I think I also ended up writing a book about the environment. And it was kind of unintentional, but halfway through writing the book, I made the connection and then it's just grown from there. And so I think that the things that are leading us to poor health, all the imbalances I just talked about, are, for the most part, the same things that are leading to poor health of the environment as far as, like, the planet goes. So, as an example, plastics. I mean, in humans, plastics are endocrine disruptors, um, so they disrupt um, the natural ability of our body to process estrogens, and so that can, uh, it kind of throws a kink in that whole metabolism. And so we're exposed to plastics all the time. People have saran wrap and plastic water bottles, um, and plastic bags are just everywhere. People put plastic in the microwave, ends up in our bodies. And so it's been directly linked to breast cancer um, and uh, lots of other um, reproductive organ uh, or, um, cancers, um, like ovarian cancer and prostate cancer, things like that. And so, but we also look at what plastic is doing to the environment. There is a plastic island out in the Pacific Ocean that 
uh, will not go away. And it was funny, my dad was watching a documentary about plastic um, maybe a month ago or so, and he was he was saying that in the documentary, they were saying, the stuff won't go away. It just, it won't biodegrade, you'll have it forever. And that's exactly what's happened. We have it forever, it won't go away. And it's um, affecting species in the ocean, making it uninhabitable in many places for species in the ocean. So if we all demanded not to have plastic in our lives, um, less of it would end up in the ocean, changing that environment as well. And then I think another example is um, farming. If we look at, I mean, farming is the uh, the biggest slap in the face to a natural ecosystem. I mean, that is in no, if we let the, the, a natural ecosystem do its thing, it would never end up looking like rows of corn in a field. Um, we, we clear all the species, all the diversity of species on that land, and we plant one species. Um, and we, in doing that, uh, and we kill all the animals that try and come on that land too. So we even clear all the animals and everything. And so in doing that, we're actually destroying that soil. And we're also um, toxifying the soil and the environment around it by spraying all the, spraying all the herbicides and pesticides on it. And so um, if we look at uh, lots of the um, more recent but ancient civilizations that uh, existed before our modern world today, like Mesopotamia, which was like the first big civilization in ancient Egypt and um, various um, civilizations like that, the land that, that is there now is desert. I mean, Mesopotamia was in Iraq and Iran, and um, uh, ancient Egypt was obviously in Egypt. And their desert because they destroyed the soils farming the same crops over and over again. That's not to say that farming is a terrible thing. We just need to find more sustainable ways to do it. And then if we look at it um, from the aspect of, I mean, I think I think that uh, our corn belt in the United States is the next thing to be a desert. Um, and the, really the only reason that we're able to keep growing um, all the corn and soy and grain on it is because we have chemical fertilizers. We've mined this oil out of the earth and made fertilizers out of it. And we run out of that stuff. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to sustain the, the production of that much um, food from, from crops. And so, unfortunately, we're at a point where we need farming um, to feed all the people in the world. Uh, but we need to find more sustainable ways of doing it. And like I said, as far as a health perspective, you know, if relying on these on these um, processed crops, these corn, grains, and soys, has been um, detrimental to our health. Uh, we can see the, the repercussions starting from the first farmers when they find archaeological, archaeological evidence that um, their bones didn't form properly. We see atherosclerosis in, in ancient Egypt, and it just kind of grows from there. Uh, and now we have this health epidemic today that is a combination of, of relying on that food and the toxins and everything. So I think that when people... Um, make healthier decisions for themselves, it ends up being healthier for the planet um, just by default. Uh, because the things that create health in us are the things that make an ecosystem um, thrive. And so if we're, if we're making us thrive, uh, if we're making the ecosystem around us thrive, even if it's just a little bit. Um, but I think that everybody started making more conscious decisions about their health, we'd get more answers to what to do going forward to save the planet as well. Yeah, you made so many good points there. It's it's apparent that we play a really big role in the health of this planet, but it's not apparent how that can also help, help us on an individual level um, with the health of our, ourselves and our families. I think a great way to wrap up this complex topic would be to leave our listeners with a few steps that they can take after listening to this to get started towards better health for them and their family and future lineage. Yeah, I think that uh, we should start with those those five imbalances and just a little something people can do about each one. So we're talking about um, our autonomic nervous system and whether our environment's stressful or not. I really think the best thing is to find your community, um, which is, again, uh, going back to, you know, the religion evolution thing. If, if religion or, or, or a church um, um, parish, whatever you call them, um, is, is what does that for you, do it. Uh, that's what's going to help you um, serve the world but find your community of people. Um, as far as toxins go, really start looking at what you're putting in and on your body. Um, really assess the vi- environments that you're in every day, your home and work, and do everything you can to reduce the toxins. Even if you don't think it's having an effect on you, uh, at some point down the line, it will. Um, and 
uh, one of the founders of functional medicine says every disease has a past, a present, and a future. So the the past of this disease may not be symptomatic, um, but if, you're, if there's toxins you're exposed to now and you're accumulating them, one day it will result in something. So be very cautious about what you come into contact with as far as these all these um, products that we have uh, to use. Then um, as far as gut diversity um, and, and gut health, I think the number one thing to do honestly, it's probably eat organic. So Jeffrey Smith, the, um, the author and speaker and activist against GMOs, did a survey of over 3,000 patients where um, he just had them go organic and um, had them report what got better um, as far as their symptoms. And they reported like 20 or 30 different ailments. But the number one, 80% of the people in the, in the survey said gut health was the number one thing that improved. Uh, and wow. it, it, they just said it completely resolved um, or it greatly improved. So go organic. And that's going to push. Wait, but I was going to say, like, even if they were eating organic pasta and organic gluten-free crackers and <laughs> they, well, you know, like, it doesn't I've... matter how much fresh food they eat. Well, yeah, of course it does. But like, just, I mean, that's all they told them to do in the study. Wow. And to me, to me, that's because they're avoiding glyphosate because that's one thing we know is not going to be in organic food because organic food can't be GMO. So therefore they can't spread glyphosate on it. Um, cause organic is just, it just means they met the standards of what they have to do mm-hmm. to call it organic. It doesn't mean it's toxin free. Um, but it, it will not have glyphosate, which I think is why people saw the gut, um, improvements. Um, but that also, you know, organic is probably not the answer, but, um, it's mm-hmm. a step in the right direction. And if more mm-hmm. people voted for that with their dollar, then maybe we, like I said, get more, um, uh, a clearer path to what to do beyond organic. Right now, we just got to get people doing the thing that's uh, the best thing we have available right now, which is organic. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as far as um, healing mitochondria, uh, you know, toxins in diet, which are two of the of the other of the five, um, avoid the toxins because those are directly damaging to mitochondria. And eat a diet that makes you um, uh, less, make less exhaust, so to speak. So that would be, you know, a higher good fat, um, lots of vegetables cooked in that good fat. And then uh, grass-fed animal products, like those things, that'll heal your mitochondria. I think we got them all. That's Good awesome. Way. So let's summarize that. We got steps to take for your health and for the environment would be to enhance your community, your sense of community, however that might be, just feeling like you belong somewhere and you have your tribe. And um, being aware of the toxins that you use or that your body is exposed to, even if you don't think that they will be affecting your health, they, they likely will in the long run. Um, eating organic so that you are avoiding avoiding glyphosate and anything that might um, disrupt your gut any further. And again, watching your toxins and um, how clean your diet is in terms of how it's metabolized in your body. So you suggested maybe minimizing a carbohydrate intake so that you are upping healthy fats, um, pasture-raised meats, and then you're burning cleaner energy and your mitochondria will be healthier. Correct. Is that right? Great. Yeah. Thanks for setting us up, dude. That's Those are some awesome stuff. action plans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I like loved you know having you here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're amazing. So I think before we leave, we just want to ask what you're working on and where can our listeners find you for more information? Yeah. So currently I'm working on uh, developing courses to put up on the website. One about um, a lot about what we talked about here, um, evolution and how it relates to health, what people can do. Um, to create better health uh, based on evolutionary principles. And then another one about the heart uh, and how people can um, achieve higher levels of heart health and what truly causes heart disease. So I'm putting those together, recording them so I can have them up on the website. And people can find me at resourceyourhealth.com. That's where I run everything. Uh, That's where the health coaching is. Uh, Most of my resources are on there. But I'm also pretty active on Facebook and Instagram. And it's just uh, Dr. Stephen Hussey, Dr. Stephen Hussey, uh, and they can find me there. I'm posting uh, what I think is interesting things on there, so we'll enjoy that. Yeah, I'm cool. totally geeking out. I love everything you're talking <laughs> about. I could listen to you for hours. So if you get that book on an audio book, it's going to be on my regular rotation. Hopefully I don't think soon. it's on Audible yet, is it? No, I, I submitted it. Like I recorded it all, and I submitted it to them, and they said 10 to 14 days. I think today's oh. the 14th day, so 
It should be soon. That's exciting. Yeah, hopefully I, awesome. hopefully I get approved because cool. I just did it like in at my house with my makeshift audio thing. And so hopefully it's the quality is good enough. Um, who did you write the book for? Like, who do you think your book is really ideal for? Um, I mean, it, it sounds like a cop out, but like everyone, I think that um, we are all one species. And I think that we, we face a lot of hard times in the future. And I think that it's hard to get everybody um, united and going the same direction. But I think that health, since that's something that um, affects everyone, is one way that we can do that. If I can ask somebody to um, go organic because it's healthier for them, not knowing that they're going to um, have a positive outlook on the planet too, or effect on the planet too, then um, I think that's one way to unite everybody and, and get us going forward. I think that if we don't uh, do something now, we're going to we're gonna have a lot of hard times in the future. And I, I think that we need to start thinking about those generations after us and setting them up for success. I think this is one way you can do it. Thank you so much. I'm really excited you. that you came. Yeah. And to all of our listeners, please share this episode because as you can see, this is a topic that is easily misunderstood and overwhelming with the amount of information, but we've sent you away with actionable steps and we have to get the word out that, that we really do have control to help us and help our planet. And Dr. Steven, I'm so happy you were here. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, guys. It was a blast. Bye. Thank you.